So in three. Great. Good afternoon. Two. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the January 16th, 2024 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Present. Mr. Young. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Ms. Frempong. Absent. Thank you. Thank you. A quorum being present, we will begin. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Mana is logged on but is um, cannot respond, but she is here, so I'm marking her as present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Street. Present. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Edwards. Absent. Ms. Smith. Absent. Present. Oh, Ms. Smith is here, thank you. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Ms. Somerville. Present. Ms. Ferguson. Present. Dr. Jones. Dr. Grubbs. Dr. DiDonato. Mr. Plate. Present. Mr. Maddox. Mr. Simak. Mr. Dixit. Present. Mr. Grimm. Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? No. Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. Opening remarks. Good afternoon. If committee members have questions that are outside the scope of these reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or me with your questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get answers to your questions. Item number three, approval of minutes. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the meetings of the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Item number four, reports. Mr. Strait, please proceed with the Health Programs and Services Audit Report. All right, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Uh, good afternoon, board members, staff, and guests. I'm presenting our audit of the Office of Health Services. The audit report is posted currently on our website and on board docs. The the audit objective was to ensure that health services develops and delivers programs and services that prevent and or mitigate health barriers to learning. Um, we tested internal controls and compliance related to board policy and superintendent rule 5420, which designates that the school health program will support achievement for all students by providing services and education to address acute and chronic health concerns and promote a healthy school environment. We also uh, tested against internal procedures and protocols found in the nursing manual and combined all of our testing was performed on a sample basis. The results of our audit disclosed no reportable issues. Health services develops and delivers programs and services that prevent and or mitigate health barriers to learning. We would like to commend Ms. Somerville for her prompt responses to audit requests and detailed explanations when follow up was required. Um, this con concludes my comments on the audit. Um, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Somerville and or Ms. Ferguson for any additional comment or Mr. McMillian for any questions. Thank you. Committee so, members, any questions? Uh, 
I see no questions from the committee members. Dr. Ferguson, would you or Ms. Somerville like to say anything? Well, first, before um, Ms. Somerville, I just like to um, congratulate her on this audit. I know um, going through audits can be pr pretty uh, stressful and take a lot of time. And I just want to thank her and her team for the support they provide to our health services program and the school based um, nursing health suites, as well as the wellness centers. They do an excellent job. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Kim. And I honestly have very little to say. I'd like to thank the audit office and um, Mr. Strait for making this process very easy and our school nurses for participating. That was, um, you know, it was a little bit of their time. I think it was as much on them as it was on my team. And so it was a pleasant process and actually a thrilling outcome. So thank you very much, Mr. Strait. Thank you very much for your cooperation on all parts. Thank you. Ms. Jabison. Please proceed with the CTE accreditation audit report. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the CTE accreditation audit. I want to thank Dr. Grubbs, the coordinator of CTE, for being here with us today. Uh, just so you know, this report is posted on our website and on board docs if you'd like to look at it in more detail. The objective of the audit was to determine if eligible CTE programs were properly accredited. And according to MSDE, there are three CTE programs in the state that are accredited, and they are the Automotive Service Technology Programs, Culinary Arts and Bacon and Pastry Arts Programs, and the Graphic and Print Communication Technology Programs. So the Office of CTE oversees the accreditation process for these programs for BCPS. Uh, the results of the audit, we did, ha did not have any reportable issues noted, so that's a, that's a wonderful uh, thing. Um, all eligible BCPS CTE programs are properly accredited. Um, in 22-23, Sollers and Western received the ASC accreditation for the automotive program. In 23-24, Kenwood and Western will undergo the graphic and print communication accreditation process, and Sollers will undergo the baking and culinary accreditation process. And then in 24-25, Eastern and Carver will undergo culinary and Milford Mill will, will undergo automotive. So those were the results of our audit. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but it was a, it was a very easy audit to, to go through since all the accreditation um, processes were being met. So thank you to the Office of CTE for their cooperation during the audit. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, committee members. Any questions? I don't see any. OK, we're going to move on. Mr. Edwards, please proceed with the construction change order audit report. I'm going to take that for Mr. Edwards. He's unable to be with us tonight. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Stevens. I'm the assistant chief auditor, and we recently worked with the office facilities construction improvement uh, to complete an audit of the construction change order process. Uh, our objective was to determine if controls related to the construction change order process are in place and operating effectively. Uh, as you may know, change orders are an integral part of the construction process. They are necessary to give the school system and the contractors the flexibility to alter original contracts due to changes in the scope of a project, any code changes, if there's errors, or if there are unforeseen conditions. BCPS typically includes an additional 10% of the original contract amount in its construct construction contracts as a contingency to cover any unanticipated costs that might arise during construction. Additionally, change order amounts are tracked, and if the cumulative total of the change orders on a project exceeds the approved contingency amount, the board must be notified and they must determine if a, an increase to the contingency amount is approved. The professional staff in the Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement are responsible to review, track, and approve all construction change orders. Uh, we did have three issues identified in this audit, which we will discuss in a moment, but first I'd like to highlight three areas that we reviewed uh, where there were no exceptions. Uh, we checked to make sure that the total contract spending authority that's approved by the board for the projects reviewed were within the limits that were approved by the board. Uh, we found no exceptions with this test work. We also checked to ensure that change orders were not split into multiple transactions in order to circumvent circumvent any approval limits. Once again, we found no exceptions in this area. 
We also reviewed the resumes of the Office of Facilities Construction Improvement team members. We found that their qualifications include a minimum of 28 years of construction and or engineering experience, as well as the education and certifications that are commensurate with their job duties. Um, before I move on to discuss the issues we identified in the audit, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dixit, and he would like to take a moment to introduce his team. Mr. Dixit, are you available? Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Andrea, uh, Mr. Fletcher, and the team for doing a very pro professional audit of our construction change orders, and also want to recognize my team member. I have here Mr. Plate, who's the Director of Construction and Improvement. Uh, I have Mr. Maddox, if he's here. Uh, he is the Manager of Construction and Improvement. And Mr. Dean Simak, who's the Senior Supervisor for Construction Improvement. These professionals are, um, uh, are part of a major construction program, which runs into hundreds of millions of dollars. And as a result, there are multiple change orders and they have done a commendable job. So I just wanted to recognize them and acknowledge their hard work. All right, thank you so much. All right, we'll uh, cover the issues that we uh, that we found now. So the first issue relates to the standard operating procedures for change orders that have not been recently updated. Uh, the office does have written procedures uh, that were developed in 2009, but they have not yet been updated to reflect their current process. Um, our recommendation was to update those written procedures related to the change orders, making sure that they're reviewed um, and updated to reflect all current processes. So at this time, I believe, Mr. Plate, you're going to address the corrective action um, for these issues. Yes, Deborah, thank you. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, the Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement will update the uh, standard operating procedures for change orders within the current process and within the current uh, uh, standard template um, by July 1st of this year. All right, great, thank you. Uh, the second issue relates to uh, receipt of written notification of potential change orders prior to the initiation of the work by the contractor. Uh, for 11 of the 39 change orders that we tested, documentation reviewed indicates that the contractor actually began work to complete the changes to the contract prior to providing written notification to BCPS and starting the approval process by BCPS. The number of calendar days from the start, the time the contractor started work until the time they notified BCPS in writing uh, ranged from 42 to 796 days. Um, it averaged um, approximately 232 days between those two um, periods of time. Um, it should be noted that changes to a contract may need to be made quickly to address safety concerns or to maintain a project schedule. So it's not unusual uh, for this to happen. However, uh, BCPS, um, if they unofficially approve the expedited change order, um, they, we need to make sure that we're keeping uh, track of it and documenting it. Uh, so for this issue, uh, we recommend that the procedures are developed and implemented to determine when the expedited change order approval process is warranted to be used and how BCPS will document staff's unofficial approval of those proposed changes prior to the start of the work by the contractor. Uh, Mr. Plate, could you discuss the corrective action plan for this issue? Absolutely, thank you. Um, typically, the construction change directive, what is known as the CCD, is probably the most appropriate procedure for expediting change orders, um, especially those that are critical to the schedule and may take longer to get approval. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, we have already done this, and uh, is take the CCD process and standardize it, implement it, uh, which we actually did during the auditing process. And we will include that process within the SOP when it's revised between now and July 1st of this year. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the third and final issue relates to internal change order procedures that were not always followed by BCPS staff, and that related back to two of the 39 change orders that were reviewed. Uh, for one of the change orders, the uh, 
team did not obtain the review, I'm sorry, required approval from the facility's executive director and the BCPS superintendent for one change order that exceeded $50,000. Uh, that is the, the limit for when those two um, approvals are required. Uh, additionally, for another uh, change order, the facilities and construction and improvement staff did not obtain a justification letter um, from the project manager for a $49,500 change order. Uh, justification letter basically states why the change order was necessary. So for both of these instances, they were identified as an oversight. Therefore, we are recommending just uh, that the team take steps to ensure that all the change orders are properly supported and approved. And we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Plate. Thank you. Um, this pati these particular two change orders um, were outside of the Office of Facility Construction and Improvement. And so one of the things that we've decided to do to make sure that all directors within the, uh, within the department are aware of it is that the executive director, Mr. Dixit, uh, for the Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning will ensure that all office directors within the department review and sign the standard operating procedure for change order process and distribute it to all applicable departmental employees once completed between now and July 1st of 2024. Great, thank you so much. So that concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank Mr. Dixit, Mr. Plate, Mr. Maddox, and Mr. Simek for their assistance and support during the audit. It was very much appreciated by me and by Mr. Dwayne Ed Edwards, who was the auditor in charge of this project. Unfortunately, Dwayne was unable to attend our meeting this afternoon, but I would like to give him credit for his detailed work on this project. Um, additionally, a copy of the report is available on the internal audit website. <clears throat> and I'd be happy to take any questions now from the committee, if, they ha if there are any. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? I don't see any, but I have one. Certainly. Mr. Dixit, or Mr. Pete, Mr. Plate, Mr. Uh, Dr. Grimm, anybody can answer this that wants to chime in. As, as some of you know, I live in a community by Ken, around Kenwood. And when they were going through their, their turf, you know, I know that there was some delays in that process, but I became involved in a conversation with somebody outside the system. And they said that, and, and I just want to know if this is nonsense or not, said that, you know, a lot of times construction firms will lowball their bids and then their strategy is then they'll, they'll, what they'll do, they'll get their money back or get the money that they want through change orders. Is, is there a possibility that's a strategy that some construction firms use or is that total nonsense? Thank you. So I'll start. Uh, I'm not aware of any contractor who's doing that because the process for change order, uh, as you just heard, is, is a quite complex process. Uh, change orders are reviewed by the project manager, by the engineer that's assigned to the project, and in some cases by the construction manager. So there are different levels of checks and cross checks. So for somebody to do it, and uh, jump all the hurdles. Uh, I do not know of any case, and then I'll get Mr. Plate to elaborate on that if I missed anything. No, and Pete, that's very accurate. One of the things that can create change orders is typically just unknown circumstances. Um, we try to take care in the design plan development to make sure that there are no uh, change orders um, that are simply mistakes or errors on the part of the architect. Those are few and far between. So for a contractor to try to utilize that philosophy, they're going to they're going to end up being in trouble before the end of the project and not being able to make the money that they were hoping to make. No, change orders on average amount to about 6%. That's a, actually an industry standard. We're right around the industry standard. Uh, and that is not sufficient for some of the um, for somebody to try to to uh, lowball their 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 uh, bids. It's not a very smart move on the part of the contractor. Okay, Mr. Graham, Dr. Graham, you want to add anything? 
No, I don't. I don't need to add anything. Uh, in the short time that I've been working with with uh, Pete and Merrill, um, they have a, a very standardized process of how they not only field their change orders and and receive them from their contractors, but they provide a very detailed explanation to the superintendent around why the change order was necessary and where it came from. Um, so I, I would agree, um, Merrill's comment that that is not a sound strategy when you when you look at the overall part of the project. Um, there, in fact, have been a number that that I've seen where our team has gone back and said that they had negotiated or they had explained to the contractor that they would not be paying the, the change order because they didn't accept what the contractor was trying to tell them. Um, in fact, in, in one project, recent project that we had a delay on, that was part of the reason is that the change order had not worked with, with BCPS in the past and they were trying to um, ask for a change and more money, which our team did not feel was warranted. Um, so I do know that the team heavily scrutinizes this um, and is very careful about how they communicate these different issues. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your answer and thanks for your prudence and, and watching this whole, uh, this whole operation. Thank you very much for your help. Okay, we're gonna move on. Item number five, new business. Ms. Barr, please proceed with the FY24 quarter two Office of Internal Audit work plan. Thank you, good afternoon. The Office of Internal Audit FY24 Q2 update reflects plan and unplanned audit projects from July 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023. But I wanted to make sure that the committee and the public were aware that I had to submit a corrected copy of the Q2 report and that was placed on board docs this afternoon. The corrected errors are noted on the cover page of the report and we apologize for any inconvenience. In uh, quarter two, we had 32 audit projects identified as of December 31st. However, this afternoon, I will just present only the changes between quarter one and quarter two. So in quarter two, we had 14 projects that were not started, and this was down five from quarter one. Uh, we had one project in the Division of Fiscal Services, six projects in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, two projects in the Division of Schools, and four projects in the Division of Human Resources, and one project under the Chief Operating Officer. <clears throat> also in quarter two, we had five projects that uh, were deferred, and this is an increase of four from quarter one. Um, you'll recall that the committee at its last meeting approved the superintendent's request to defer the projects related to the Office of Payroll, Office of School Climate, the Department of Employee Training and Development and um, DRAW, Strategic Management Plan. We also saw a decrease in the number of projects that were in planning in quarter two. We had two that were in planning. That was the Help Desk and Repair Shop Services and also acting as the MSDE State Aid Audit Liaison. In uh, quarter two, there were five projects that were, were in various stages of field work, which is a decrease um, from quarter one of two projects. And those projects that were in field work were the Office of Purchasing, the MBE program, the Office of School Safety, the School Safety Measures program, Department of Enterprise Solutions, the SAS Application Compliance Audit, the Office of Transportation, the Bus Contractor Management Audit, and Staff Relations, the Advanced Academics EDA Audit. Um, in quarter two, we had one that was in the uh, reporting stage, and that was down one from quarter one, and that is the Special Education Dispute Resolution Project. And all those changes are probably reflected more in the number of reports that were issued, and we had 10 reports um, that were issued, and that's an increase of eight over quarter one. We had the PIA request audit. Uh, that report was issued in October as well as the IT security audit and the food service financial review memo and the Carroll Manor school activity fund and procurement card audit. They were all issued in October of 2023. We had the advanced academics eligibility report issued in November of 23 as well as the CTE accreditation report that you heard uh, this afternoon. And then last month in December, we had the health services program report issued as well as the facilities construction change order. And you just heard those reports presented uh, this afternoon. 
As you're aware, board policy 8400 now requires us to provide quarterly summaries of significant audit issues and an update of corrective measures taken related to prior audit issues and recommendations to both the board and the superintendent. And this list is included at the end of the Q2 report and it's continually updated as audit projects are completed. So in quarter two, we had 11 issues added, 12 issues were closed, uh, 22 issues were still in the process of resolution and 11 were scheduled for follow up in either quarter three or quarter four. And as previously stated, uh, this report is in addition to all the other reports is posted on our website. And now I have um, concluded my report and I'm open to any comments or questions related to our update. Committee members, any questions? I don't see any. Ms. Barr, thank you very much. You're welcome. No questions. We're going to move on to item number six, announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, me, February. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Fletcher has to do the Q2 investigation report. And then we have. An, OK, one I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I skipped down. I'm sorry. That's on me. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fletcher, please proceed with the FY24 quarter two investigation update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Million. I do appreciate um, getting the opportunity to speak to everyone this afternoon. So this is a report of our year to date investigative uh, statistics as of the end of the second quarter 2024. And <clears throat> I'm actually going to um, talk through the statistics. So as of the end of the second quarter, we received a total of 62 cases. And table one within this report will actually summarize those cases, which shows that 25 were kept for investigation by internal audit. Now, of those 25, two were a conflict of interest, two were a falsification of records, five were payroll fraud or overtime abuse, 12 were misuse of property or resources, and four were theft. Now, as we continue to talk on in, in uh, table two within this report, we note that in addition to the 62 new cases received so far this fiscal year, 32 cases were open at the end of the previous fiscal year, resulting in 94 cases that either are or have been open throughout fiscal year 24. Now, so far in fiscal year 24, 82 of those 94 cases have been closed, resulting in 12 cases that are still open as of the end of the second quarter. Now, for the Office of Internal Audit Investigations, uh, which are separated into that first column on, on table two, 46 were open throughout the fiscal year and 34 have been closed, which are the, the 12 that are still open as of the end of the second quarter. Details for all of those cases are, are further below in, in table three. Now, in addition, uh, and we started this at, at our last presentation as well, but in addition, please remember that we have included data visualization charts that provide additional information related to the types of cases uh, that come through our hotline. Uh, basically takes that information and gives you a different way to, to view and break down that data. And Mr. McMillian, I turn it back over to you for any questions. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Miss Miss Lichter, please, your question. Um, just one question. When it's identified and listed as employee behavior, do you investigate that or does that go right to the Office of Internal Investigations? So typically uh, it's it's going to go actually to the to the superintendent's office for them to um, um, determine what area they want to have investigate that. Okay. Uh, there are times and it really gets down to what the the behavior is uh, before I, I would really say 95% uh, of the time is going to go that direction. Okay, I just I'm just trying to get the audit versus investigation piece kind of uh, completely understood. understood. Right. Completely understood. And, and essentially, it really comes down to uh, the fraud, waste, and abuse differentiation. So if it, if it is a true allegation of fraud, waste, or abuse, uh, that is something that we would keep and, and investigate. Keeping in mind, if, if it's considered fraud, waste, or abuse, there is a, within the allegation now, there is a, um, uh, a clear line that they're saying, okay, the, there is a policy or a rule or a law uh, that has been violated. 
And so that is typically um, required in order to fall into that fraud, waste, or abuse. With the and employee behavior is a perfect example. Sometimes it's just interpersonal relationships, uh, people not getting along with each other, uh, things like that. Um, anything like that that's that is truly personnel related. Um, you know, I, I saw this employee smoking out back. That that's going to go uh, to to the superintendent's office for them to determine where uh, and who they would like to to review that. And that's the new piece, right? That it goes to the superintendent and then to whichever office. Correct. And really, the only the only new piece now is that we send it to the superintendent's office. I, actually, I send it directly to, to Ms. Stifler, um, and and they uh, then review and and determine the course of action that they want to take and who they want to um, have investigate that. In the past, we would keep that. And set, uh, when I say keep that, we would uh, review that and send that directly to whether it be an executive director or right. a man, whoever would be the appropriate level of management to review that. Right. So when it says substantiated, like when I'm looking at the one, I don't know, like the first one I yeah. see on table three and it says uh -huh. employee behavior substantiated. Did you substantiate that or did whomever the superintendent? Yes. Any, anything in table three is something that we substantiated. Um, okay. and, and although I don't recall that particular one off the top of my head, if it is classified as as employee behavior, it's probably a combination uh, of some of those others that are more common uh, that, that you would see the the theft and the misuse and the uh, um, the payroll issues that you would typically see. OK, thank you. Absolutely. Any additional questions? I see something in the chat. Let's see. OK, so Miss. Miss Jamison's left the meeting, OK, and Miss Stevens is going to pick up for Miss Jamison at this point. Uh, thank you very much, much, Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. We're going to move on. Miss Barr, please proceed with the discussion regarding rescheduling the May 2024 audit committee meeting. Thank, thank you. So election day now falls on May 14, 2024. Consequently, we have to reschedule our May meeting in consultation with Ms. Gover. She has provided four dates that show no conflict with other board activities. Those dates are Wednesday, May 8, Thursday, May 9, Monday, May 20, and Thursday, May 23rd. Uh, our preference, if it counts towards anything, is to hold it on Monday, May the 20th, as our, nobody in the office has any scheduling conflicts, and it is approximately one month prior to our final meeting of the fiscal year, which is scheduled for June 18th. But again, those dates are Wednesday, May 8, Thursday, May 9, Monday, May 20, and Thursday, May 23rd. I turn it back over to you for for Okay, Ms. Barr, how do you want to go around about making that decision? You want me to send that out to the uh, to the committee members in an email? That that probably would be best, but I just wanted to alert to the committee this evening um, that it is an issue, and these were the four dates provided by Ms. Gover that would have no no board activity conflicts for for board members that are on the committee. Okay, I just happened to check. I'm free on Monday, uh, May 20th myself. But why don't we construct, if you don't mind, if you would put those email, put those dates in an email and then send it us and we'll make the decision with the understanding that, that the 20th works for you guys. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Any other questions from the committee members? Okay, so we're going to move on now to item six and the announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, February 20th, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Item number seven, administrative function session. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function session. May so I have moved, a motion? So moved, Lichter. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. I need a second, Mr. Young. Second. Thank you very much. It has been properly moved and seconded that we convene an administrative function. Ms. Stevens, please. <laughs> Will you please call the roll? I sure will. I'll start with Ms. Lichter. Yes. Uh, Ms. Frumpong is absent. Mr. Young? Yes. And Mr. McMillian? Yes. All right, thank you. 
Thank you very much.